All right, we'll get started in just a second. Everybody jumped on the last minute or so. Appreciate everybody putting their information in the chat makes it a little bit easier for us to keep track. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Whitney Catchmark with HRPDC. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, hopefully everyone is aware of the fact that uh, we send out the agenda materials via email and they're also posted online. So if you happen to be on the phone, you should be able to grab that and follow along. Um, other than that, let's see, it's just a reminder that we're having these meetings virtually because of um, the state of emergency declared by the Commonwealth of Virginia in response to COVID-19. So we're going to keep doing that for a little while. It seems to be working. Um, today, since we do have a vote at the end of the meeting, I want to go ahead and take a roll call of voting members. So we need 10 uh, localities represented to, to have a vote. And that way, if we um, don't have them, we can scramble around and try to find a few people before the end of the meeting. So, uh, Ben, can you go ahead and do that? Sure. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to call them out by locality, uh, and then I have the names for each locality. So, uh, Chesapeake, Barbara Brumbach. Present. Franklin, Carly Franklin, Smith. Carly Smith. Gloucester, Gloucester, Mike Hudgens, and Kevin Landry. And Kevin Landry. Kevin Landry is present. Kevin Landry is present. Hampton. Hampton. Greta Hawkins. Greta Hawkins. Greta is here. Greta is here. Don't know what's with the echo, but please meet. Echo, but please meet. Okay. Isle of Wight. David Kuzma. David Kuzma. Okay. James City County. Tony Small and Michael Wilson. We are both present. Both present. Okay. Newport News, Angela Hopkins and Kim Mosher. Kim's present. Did I pronounce your last name right? Yes. Norfolk, Justin Schaefer and June Whitehurst. Justin's present. The coast and Dan and O'Connell. Portsmouth, Meg Pittinger and Thomas Quattlebaum. This is Meg, I'm here. Great. Smithfield, Tammy Clary and Jack Reed. Southampton, Beth Lewis. Present. Okay. Suffolk, Aaron Roundtree. We don't have a current yeah, voting member from Surrey. Virginia Beach, Melanie Coffee, and Diana St. John. Diana's here. Okay. Williamsburg, Heather Markle, and Aaron Small. Present. Okay. We don't have anybody from Windsor. Uh, York County, Kent Hinkle. Yeah, I'm here, Ben. Present. Great. We have 12 localities present, which means we have a quorum. That makes it easy. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, so uh, the first thing on the agenda is um, approval of the minutes. Does anybody have any comments or um, corrections to the minutes? All right, well, I need to change this in the future because I feel like we don't need to vote on this, but um, can I have a motion to approve by consensus? So moved. Second. Thank you. 
Thank you. All those in favor, all you say favor. aye. You say aye. 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 Is any, is any sorry, thank you. <laughs> is anybody opposed or have any changes? All right, thank you. I'll work on that process piece. All right, so next up um, is the public comment period. Um, does anybody want to make a formal comment today? You can unmute yourself. Nope. All right, well, we will move along. All right, so our first speaker um, it is Molly Mitchell from VIMS. She's going to talk to us about a new product uh, that came from a collaboration between VIMS and Penn State University. So, Molly, if you're ready, I'll let you share your screen and give people um, an update on this Community Climate Outlook product. Thank you, Whitney. Um, yeah, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to try and start presentation mode. Tell me if it doesn't show up for you guys. All good? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I'm talking today about a product that um, I was involved in, but actually there was a coastal climate extension specialist position that was created between VEMS and Penn State University. Um, to try and extend the work of Marisa, which I'm going to tell you a little more about in a minute, into Virginia. Virginia was not originally part of the Marisa um, framework. So we've had two people in the Coastal Climate Extension Specialist position. The first one was Pam Braff, who is now um, doing a Canals Fellowship up in NOAA. Um, and then the second one was Ben Watson, who has just finish the position. So what I'm telling you about really is their work, um, but we are actually continuing this. So we are hiring new person into this position. Um, so we're in a little bit of a gap right now, but we will be moving this forward. Okay, so what is Marisa? Um, Marisa stands for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment. And there are RISAs all through the country. You can see on this map here, there are a number of different ones um, for different regions. It's a NOAA funded initiative um, to look at climate variability and climate change and really to try and connect that with um, informing and educating stakeholders. So the Big goals are to um, improve climate data, so to downscale these big, um, to downscale these big global climate models to locality levels, so that they're really regionally relevant or really locally relevant. Um, to help assess place-based decision support, and for public engagement um, efforts. So these are. Um, Right now, just for um, the coastal part of Virginia, but the idea is to expand it for all of Virginia and then up through the Chesapeake Bay region and eventually for every locality in the Marisa region. Um, so this is what a community climate outlook looks like. This is York County's community climate outlook. Um, and it is a two page document. Originally, these were developed um, the idea was they would be printed, and so they could be put out, handed out at events, they could be put in libraries, they could be, you know, put in places where um, the public could come across them. Um, however, with the onset of COVID, which was right when we were developing these things, we have opted for, a, currently it's an online only format, um, but these can be downloaded online. Um, in the coastal region, they talk about sea level rise and temperature and precipitation changes, and then what some of those impacts are going to be associated with them. Um, as we move into the non-coastal region, the sea level rise part is not relevant, um, so it just focuses on temperature and precipitation. Um, so the goal of these is not really um, to aid planning because the information behind them, or the information isn't presented in a way that is detailed enough to aid planning. 
Um, it's more to raise awareness, to allow the public to be educated, for the public to have something they can take to board members, that kind of thing to help educate them. So this is this is where we're going with that. However, there are links to all of the data. So if you are interested in using it for planning, you can actually go to the websites where this data is housed and get that information. The sea level rise is um, based on, these are in the NOAA curves. So this envelope is from the NOAA low scenario to the um, extreme scenario. And then the dotted line is the intermediate high because that's what we have um, chosen to use for state planning in Virginia. And so there's a lot of interest in using it in other places. So that's the highlighted um, range on the sea level rise. Um, and then the temperature and precipitation, I'm gonna talk a little more about where they came from. Um, so one of the things I wanted to say is that um, this is a beta version. So we are definitely looking for feedback and we're interested in ways to make it more effective or what information would be more helpful to people. Um, like I said, we are hiring a new person to finish this project out. Um, so at the moment, nothing will change if you give us feedback, but we will take that into consideration and we will um, bring that to the new person. Okay, yeah, like I said, temperature and precipitation, we're gonna focus on those. So both the temperature and the precipitation data come from MACA. Um, and MACA is a statistical method that downscales global climate models into a local scale. So it takes it down to four kilometer grids, relatively small, um, using a method called bias correction. So you can see that you know, the global scale, the global climate model, global climate models have these really big grid squares. Um, and we want to get it down to something more continuous. So um, what they do is this is this blue one is the observed. Um, I, I'm not sure what this is Oh, for for the temperature, the maximum temperature. Okay, so this is the observed distribution for maximum temperature um, historically. And then this is what the model says the 20th century looks like. Um, this is what the model says the 21st century looks like. So you can map these back to the observed data and you get a correction. Okay, so now it's locally corrected. Um, and for the stuff we used, uh, it used grid met data, which is the historic data at the four kilometer grid scale from 1979 through 2012. Um, there's a lot of available data sets here. Obviously, in the outlooks, we could inc only include one temperature and one precipitation metric, um, but there's actually a lot of different metrics that might be of interest in planning um, information. And then when you have these four kilometer grids, you can average or filter the data across a lot of different geographies. So we chose to do it across a locality. So when you see these projections, it is specific to the locality on that card. And the projections may vary from locality to locality if there's actual differences in those four kilometer grids that make up each locality. Um, and then I just put a note across the bottom. Ben tells me this has been posted to the website. So um, that's probably the best way to do it so you don't have to write it down. But if you wanna know details about how this method works, um, this is the website where they talk about how the MACA method is used to bias correct data. Okay, so the precipitation data, again, we had to pick a single metric and this was um, difficult. Um, so this is one of the things it'd be interesting to get some feedback on is whether this is a meaningful um, metric. So, um, this is the annual count of days with more than two inches of rain, okay? And then the percent change from historic to um, current, okay? But these are, um, well, percent change from the 1960 to 1989, okay? And then these are the forecasted ones. Um, and so what it is on the graph is these are hindcast in gray so these are modeled historic data. Okay, so these are the modeled that stuff. And then moving forward, we have blue, which is the low emissions, which is RCP 4.5. 
And the pink is the high emissions, which is RCP 8.5. You can see um, they have different results in the near term and then moving out further, we start to see the higher precipitation in the RCP 8.5, um, which is more what people expect to see. Um, so we chose, we had a hard time picking about this. Okay, so we chose um, to show relative change in frequency than rather than the absolute number of storms um, over two inches um, because heavy rainfall is a really, really local event. So it's actually something the global climate models have a hard time doing those fine scale processes. Um, so when you downscale them, you're not, um, that four kilometer grid is, is kind of small compared to the scale on which these global climate models are working. Um, so we didn't want people to put too much emphasis on an actual number, like say, oh, I'm expecting 10 storms this year with more than two inches of rain, um, because we know that resolution is not actually there in the projections yet. All right, so these are the temperature. Um, we did the number of annual days over 95%, but wow, the temperature can be calculated in so many different ways. So again, if there's a metric you think is most useful or most informative to people educating themselves, um, we'd love to hear about it. So again, the gray are um, the gray dots are the observations. This one's a little different because we also have this gray bar, and these are hindcast. So these are modeled historic data. Okay, so the gray dots are the observed historic data, and this gray range here is the modeled historic data. Um, and then moving forward, there is um, again. The blue is the RCP 4.5, the low emission scenario, and the red pink is the high emission scenario. Um, and one of the things to be aware of looking for it in temperature data is that we train our projections on historic data sets. That's how we um, do the correction, the bias correction in them, right? So they can overlook changes in land use, um, so growing heat islands, that kind of thing, are not going to be captured in this. Um, so this is, you know, for a um, locality, this is the general distribution we expect to see, but there may be spots that have bigger impacts, particularly in urban areas. Okay, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about um, other Marisa tools and products that are available because I don't think people in this region are that familiar with them. Um, so there, Marisa does put out Mid-Atlantic Regional Climate Summaries um, every mm, quarterly, I think. They might come out every month. Um, and so these um, have information about how the past, recent past um, has been and how it compares to, you know, future, or I mean, historic past information. Okay, so this is, um, a graph of snowfall this past winter compared to snowfall um, that we would expect to see. Um, and then there is a page with Mid-Atlantic Climate Data Tools. This has a lot of information on it, um, so I'm just going to show you really quickly. It's got hurricane tracks, frequency and intensity of recorded tropical storms and hurricanes, reported crop and property damage from hurricanes and tropical storms. It also has all these precipitation, um, so these are changes, so this is historic precipitation, and then these are expected future changes in precipitation. Um, same thing with temperature, we have changes in the historic record, and then we have what we expect to see in the future, um, both in like annual number of days with warm low temperatures, but also uh, changes in the last day to freeze and first day of warm, so it's presented in a number of different ways. So this might be useful information for you um, if you're looking to incorporate temperature and precipitation changes into your planning efforts. Um, there is also a data portal. Um, so this is the Cheswick area. Um, and so these are downscaled climate data specific to our region. 
um, and they have historic data from a number of different sites. So MACA is only one way of downscaling um, climate data. Um, so there's a lot of other climate data that's available that you can look at. Um, these are all observational ones, okay. Um, and then there is also a new tool, which is an inventory. Um, it's an inventory of tools in the Chesapeake Bay region and to help you select them. So you can go down and you can search by keyword, or in this case, I picked geographic region, Chesapeake Bay, model type decision making, and it uh, brings up the Chesapeake Bay program scenario builder. What's nice about this tool is that when you click on it, it opens up this window here. Um, it tells you where you can you know, find it, um, but it also tells you a lot of information that helps you decide whether you want to bother hunting down the tool or not. So it tells you the spatial resolution, what type of outputs are um, come out of the model. It also tells you, um, is, is this meant for decision making? In this case, it is a practitioner would use it. Um, and there's some I have cut off here at the bottom, but it tells you, do you need to provide the data? Or does it have the data? That kind of information. Um, okay, so um, we, if you want to find the Outlook, they can either be found on this link here. We've also put a link on ADAPTBA, so you can link through ADAPTBA to it. These are all the localities that have currently been done. Um, and like I said, we would really appreciate feedback and thoughts on it. Unfortunately, right now, um, because our current climate extension specialist has left, there is no email to contact to give your thoughts about this. So <laughs> you can email me. My email is molly at bims.edu. If you have thoughts about it, um, I would be happy to hear. And um, I'm happy to take some questions if people have any. Um, stop sharing. I had a question about the precipitation data. Mm -hmm. Um. Why are you, why is the prediction that the rate of higher frequency events would go down over the next couple decades before they would go back up again? Yeah. Um, so the precipitation, the precipitation that is a little bit difficult. Um, so if you're looking at average annual precipitation, the models do a really good job with that. The problem is when you're talking about big storm events, it depends on the way that the storm moves, right? We all know that, like maybe Hampton gets three inches of rain out of one storm and Williamsburg gets a half inch out of the same storm, right? Um, and so predicting that for the future is, um, it's something where you need to be cautious about how far you extrapolate with that data um, because those big storm events you can predict that there might be more of them but it is very hard to predict that they will go over a particular area or not go over a particular area or dump all their rain in one place and not dump it somewhere else does that make sense it does but it also seems to run a little bit counter to what we've been experiencing and so I'm, i guess i'm wondering what will have changed over these next few decades that would make the rainfall different from the patterns that we've been seeing. And then I guess what would change, what you all would anticipate would change again, that would then cause the rate to start increasing again. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, <laughs> so the number of high intensity events is predicted to increase, right? So that's a generalized statement though. Okay, so then these are downscaled data to a very small four kilometer grid area. Um, and so you get some noise in there with this type of data. Um, so there is, um, there is an effort going on in Marisa right now to produce IDF curves for the state of Virginia. So those are the intense intensity duration 
intensity, duration, frequency. I'm like, that's right, right? Um, curves for everywhere. And so those are like more continuous curves. So these are the percent change. And see, this is good feedback actually, because this is something maybe we need to present differently if it's if it's complicating the understanding. Okay. So this is the percent change in 2030 from the amount of rainfall seen in 2060 through 2080, okay, on a very local scale. Um, so you see it going up, okay, over time, right? So it went up through the, well, let me, let me show you. Uh, okay, so can I go up? Okay, so you see first in the 1970s, it's a little lower than we expected from that average, right? And then the 1980s, it's a little higher, 1990s and the 2000s. Um, and so then in 2010s, the modeled data is higher than it was in the 2000s. In the 2020s, it's a little lower. In the 2030s, it's a little lower. This is for York County specifically, okay? So this is just those grid cells, not every county will be exactly the same. Um, but some of this is just noise in that spatial distribution, okay? But so this is not saying that intense precipitation will go down. It's saying that the percent of increase from this historic period is not as high as what we might see in 2010. Um, but of course, that's in the past now. 2010 is more, we've gotten past 2010 now. Um, yeah. I was going to ask Molly, so why do you use modeled hind casting instead of observed? Um, yeah, so we did look at it with the observed too, and I can't remember honestly exactly why it was decided not to do that. Um, I think it was that the observed, something about the way it was displayed or the way it was summarized was different. Um, well, but yeah. <laughs> say like, I mean, I think in combination of my thoughts and what Brian's saying is like, it's, it is a little hard to tell if we, when you look at this graph, if it affirms the idea that we're having more frequent intense rainfall events or we're not and, and why the model would predict a dip and then an increase, like, I don't, I don't know what the drive yeah. would be for that. So I don't know if there's, if it's a display of data or just like, I don't know what to think of this analysis. Yeah. So it's it, right. So it's not really an analysis. It is just the results of the model of the global climate model. Um, but it is precipitation is the one we've had the hardest time figuring out how to display in logical ways because the models are just not, um, they're just not developed to be used on really local scales. So when they're downscaled, you get a lot of noise in the variation. I mean, you can't, a, a rainfall event that's coming through two days from now, we can't tell you if you're gonna get more than two inches of rain in York County, right? Um, so this is the difficulty with it. And so, um, so I appreciate these, thoughts because we have wrestled with this and what I'm hearing is we're still not there. Um, we need to try to figure out another way to get this change in rainfall in a way that is um, understandable and makes the, a way that's clearly understandable that doesn't raise more questions when you're looking at it than answers, right? I have, I have a question or a couple of comments. I sent you a, mm -hmm. a chat thing, um, but I, I think um, a lot of people probably don't realize that, at least my understanding, I've read quite a bit on this, is that the global climate models don't have a variable necessarily called precipitation. You're downscaling relative humidity or a geopotential height or some other it's a climate variable not necessarily a meteorological variable and 
so my question is how are the rainfall estimates generated because the the most uh uh common method i've seen is to use various statistics to downscale the variables um which are appropriate <clears throat> um calibrate those to a statistical weather generator and then use that weather generator a thousand times or whatever to to come up with the changes in precipitation and that typically those weather generators underestimate the extremes and you do something like a Fourier analysis to to adjust that data. So if you want the details, I'm going to have to send you to the MACA website, as I suggested. Um, in the talk, because that is where all the details of how they downscale. We didn't downscale it. That is an already downscaled um, climate data set, but it is corrected against observational data, um, like you said, where you create a distribution of historic and modeled um, and, and correct them. So I suggest you go to the MACA website and you can see exactly how this one did. Now, there are several ways you can downscale climate data. We chose MACA because it's one of the better ones at capturing um, intense precipitation, but it's still, like you said, it they, they have a hard time with um, the intense precipitation. And, you know, that's exactly the problem with the, the small versions. You know, even even two days in advance, it's hard to predict that. So predicting it years in advance is very difficult. All right, thank you guys. This is um, great feedback. Does anyone else have any thoughts or questions? So I just had one question at the out. Let's see the outlooks like you said, they're designed to more for the public. Do you all have any plans to do any rollout or, or are you trying to be the agency to <laughs> each people? No, so we, we, the idea is 1 of the things the community. Outreach that the, um. Outreach specialist, the, the climate extension specialist was supposed to do was a lot of. Public rollout, that kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, again, everything went um, virtual, right? When we started this effort, so um, so we're still hoping to do that um, when we have, you know, someone someone in that position to do it. All right. Thanks. Okay, uh, any more questions before we move on? Yeah, sorry. I wanted to ask one last question along the climate model. I was curious why you all thought it might be that the rate is lower under high emissions um, projections than under low emissions projections. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly why that is. Um, I'll be honest. I, Like I said, we don't do the downscaling. Um, these are models you can go and download the MACA data from the website that that link is in the slide. Um, so I'm not sure exactly why that is. Yeah. All right. Oh, um, we're going to go ahead and move along and we were kind of looking at the time. I know we want to make sure that we have people sticking around for our vote. So we are going to move the. Update on the Environment Virginia Symposium to the end, um, just to make sure uh, that we get to our guest speakers and our vote. So, um, assuming um, Alexa, are you ready to do your presentation? And I was going to skip down to the Great Dismal Swamp Stakeholder Collaborative. Sure. sure. All right. Well, um, I I will let you tell um, us all about it and share your slides. Um, we haven't heard too much about this in the past, so excited to hear more. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Um, let me try to get my slides up. And with the caveat, are you all able to hear me okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and if you don't, if you have trouble with slides, I have them up. And so just let me know and I'll throw them up. Okay, cool. All right. Let me try it really quickly and then 
but we'll see, I should be able to share the content because I've got them open. All right. Okay, so theoretically you should be seeing my PowerPoint right now. Is that the case? Oops. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We see you, Great. but not your slides. Uh-oh, okay. All right, so then um, maybe I won't try to share my content. Maybe I'll ask someone else who's got them up to, to share them for me. Great, fantastic, thank you so much. So um, I will be a little bit brief knowing that we're under a bit of time constraint, but thanks y'all for having me. I am here representing the Great Dismal Swamp Stakeholder Collaborative, and we can kind of jump to the next slide. And so a very brief introduction to me, I grew up in Baltimore, I did my undergrad at Howard, I did, in biology, I did a master's in wildlife and fisheries at Texas A&M, I did a PhD in the environment at, in, at Duke in the Nicholas School, and then a postdoc in energy policy there as well. I have previously been the senior director for the Southeast at the Wilderness Society, and I'm stepping into a new role as of April 12th as the vice president for conservation, justice and equity at Ocean Conservancy. We'll skip to the next slide. And so I want to take a minute to uh, kind of acknowledge the place that I am calling you in from, calling in from. So I am actually seated physically down here in Chapel Hill. Um, and if you know Chapel Hill, you probably know it as the home of UNC's flagship campus. But it's also got an incredible history as a settler town that was founded in 1793 on a topographic rise. It sits just above the northern branch of the Cape Fear River watershed. But it's also the eastern edge of something that some of my ancestors call, that we call the Amani Shuk um, or the Amani Anaushika. It's the Piedmont Plateau. And this traditionally delineated the Algonquian lands to the east from Iroquois and Eastern Suwon lands to the west. It's part of a larger indigenous landscape, the Manaskane, which is the landscape of Eastern Suwon peoples. Um, and so that landscape traditionally stretched from the Piedmont Plateau west to the Blue Ridge Mountains and north to the Kanawha River Valley. And this is a place where the Yesa people, Eastern Suans, and our kin tribes have lived since time immemorial and are here now as the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, the Halawa Saponi Tribe, the Saponi Tribe, the Monacan Indian Nation, Catawba Nation, Wakama Suan, and then as just sort of integrated members of other tribes and other communities, and particularly in key urban centers as well, Baltimore, Philadelphia being two of the, the largest. Um, and so I use this land acknowledgement because when we talk about public lands and public spaces, I want us to remember that we don't come by these places neatly and that these places carry a long legacy of, of often displacement, eradication, et cetera, um, for indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples. And so it's really important that we think about that as we think about our planning and what it means to preserve place, to manage for place and to plan for place. And so that'll come up a little bit more when we talk about why we even founded the Dismal Swamp Stakeholder Collaborative. Next slide. And so just a little, a little quotation to kind of get us started in thinking about the way that the Stakeholder Collaborative functions, what we hope to do with the Dismal Swamp, what some of our shared beliefs and ideals are, kind of a little bit encapsulated in this quote from Lyndon B. Johnson about leaving something for future generations. If they're to remember us with gratitude rather than contempt, we have to leave them a glimpse of the world as it was in the beginning, not just when we got through with it. Next slide. And so what does that mean? Um, so in the context of the Great Desmo Swamp, I thought I'd pull us out to a 30,000 foot view first and take a look at where we have federal public lands and protected lands. And as I'm sure all of you already know, huge amounts of them out west, not a whole lot over here on the east and very little in the kind of mid-Atlantic and tidewater region. But Next slide. 
that's kind of tragic because as we know, if we look at maps of biodiversity, uh, when we look at the Southeast, when we look at the Mid-Atlantic, we have incredibly, incredibly rich biodiversity in a lot of these regions, a lot of these areas. And in fact, these are some of the least protected parts of the United States, and at least at a federal level. And so what that means is that it is ultra important. Um, yeah, that's fine, you can go to the next one. It is ultra important um, to think about how we protect places, protect landscapes, think about ecological sustainability at state and local levels, right? Because the federal protections aren't gonna do it for us, um, or at least not alone. And that becomes even more important when we start thinking about things that are even um, less, less, uh, less obvious and less immediate um, than biodiversity when we start thinking about carbon balance and storage. Um, and this is a map that just shows us where kind of carbon is stored um, across the US. And one of the most interesting things that I want you to pull out of this is that if you look at these different regions, you see how much carbon is in the soil right, rather than in kind of the, the living biomass, which is where folks often look to think about carbon storage, there's a huge amount of carbon that ends up being stored in soil. So next slide. That becomes even more true when we look at our particular region and when we look at the Great Dismal Swamp. Next slide. And so this map is where when we are looking at particularly irrecoverable carbon. So that means carbon that has taken a huge amount of time to get stored in the landscape, usually in, in particular types of soils, and would take just immense amounts of thousands and thousands of thousands of years to be recovered were it to be released into the atmosphere. Okay, so next slide. Zooming in a little bit, man, what do you see pops out right there in the middle? I mean, an incredibly dark, incredibly stark relief there you see the Great Dismal Swamp and a lot of the surrounding watershed. And that's primarily as a result of those really rich peat soils that store a huge amount of carbon. Next slide. And in fact, well, we, you might have to tap it again, but in fact, what we can see, right, is that that carbon storage then has, it, it makes the Great Dismal Swamp an incredibly valuable area ecologically and for future sustainability, for climate mitigation, et cetera. We can't allow that carbon to be released, essentially, because we won't get it back in terms of the, the richness of storage. Um, but what triggers releases is often fire, right? And so when we look, for example, at 2011, Lateral West Fire, which is visible on Google Maps there, you can also see the, the metric tons of carbon being released really spiking up drastically. And so the things that lead to these fires in the Dismal Swamp are primarily the ecological management, the drying of the swamp, et cetera, but these also have environmental justice implications, right? Um, because the communities that are often living downwind and living in surrounds are communities that are African-American, indigenous, and often also economically disadvantaged communities. And so we have an ecological concern, we have an environmental justice concern. Next slide. So the kind of take homes from talking a little bit first about the ecology are that the Dismal Swamp represents an incredibly large storage of carbon, mostly in peat soils. That carbon is irrecoverable when it's released. Fire can release those huge amounts of carbon from the dried out soils. So this is a part of what we think about in the Great Dismal Swamp Stakeholder Collaborative, but it's only a part the other part is this, right? Um, beautiful quote from James Baldwin that history is not merely something to be read and it does not refer, refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, that history is present in all we do. So this also kind of guides the work of the stakeholder collaborative. Next slide. So we think a lot about the peopling of the Dismal Swamp. We think about the ecological history and we think a lot about the human history as well. As you know, the first peoples living in the indigenous in the Dismal Swamp were indigenous peoples, members of Algonquian nations, members of Iroquois nations, and members of Eastern Siouan nations. The Dismal Swamp and approximately where Wakamako, which many of you may be already familiar with, were both central areas of trade, um, transit, and economy 
And so there is a lot of nations who are meeting in these places to make exchanges for diplomatic purposes, for shared cultural experiences, for education, et cetera. Um, but we, this is sort of primarily the ancestral lands of the Nansamund Indian nation. And so by the end of the 17th century, the Dismal Swamp gets peopled really, really, really fully by indigenous, African, African-American, who also Afro-descendant is a global term that is used to describe um, peoples in the Americas who are partially descended from African ancestors and European and Euro-American fugitives. By the 1730s, primary inhabitants are Africans and African-Americans. Um, and particularly there is the emergence of Maroons. And so if you're not familiar with the term Maroons, Maroons refer to particular communities of not just Africans and African-Americans, but often also native and European folks who live strictly in the swamp. They retreat from what is at the time an incredibly hostile and enslaving society by fleeing into the swamp and then living there for multiple generations. Some of the best studied maroon colonies are in Jamaica, but one of the richest sites, sources of maroon artifacts in the entire North America is actually the Great Dismal Swamp. So Dan Sayers at American University runs the Dismal Swamp Archaeological Research Project. And this is one of the places where we have just an unparalleled opportunity to really tell the story of how people survived, how they lived on Mesic Islands, what they ate, what they created, how they, how they remained fugitive for so, so, so long. And so it's an incredibly rich archaeological history to explore. And it is also an archaeological history that is still living because many of the folks who now live around the swamp, particularly in Skeeter Town and some of the, the places adjacent, are actually descendants of maroon, um, maroon ancestors. And so a lot to think about there. But by the 1840s, Dismal Swamp also becomes a site of fugitivity as a part of the Underground Railroad. And it's known as a haven for runaway slaves. And there's a lot of sort of publications and things like that about it. One of the most interesting things that also emerges from the Dismal Swamp is actually a man named Moses Grandy escapes uh, to freedom through the swamp and he writes his memoirs uh, after he does of what his experience was like living in the swamp, how he escaped, all of these things. And it's just absolutely an, again, unparalleled document that really gives us a peek into the history of this particular place in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise. The Dismal Swamp, as you know, also has an incredible colonial history that ties to early America. This was the Great Dismal Swamp uh, Canal Company, which dug the canal that remains the oldest functioning canal in the United States, was one of George Washington's early investments. It also ties again to this African-American and African history because that's a canal that was dug by hand by enslaved laborers. And so there's a lot in the peopling of the Dismal Swamp that reflects the history of this region. Next slide. Particularly, it reflects this history. If you've never seen a map of early, uh, the age of exploration and early voyages, you can see where, you know, several of those early voyages are hitting, landing right around this kind of mid-Atlantic and tidewater area. And so there is this, this long-standing and rich tie to the creation of ultimately the triangular trade, the Colombian exchange, all of the things that happen in the 1500s, 1600s that create what we now know as the world today. Next slide. It's also a place, of course, where people who are forcibly extracted for enslavement from the African continent are being brought into North America. We already know a lot of the history, of course, of Virginia as being sort of that site of early landings um, in 1619 and before. But also, or 1619 and afterward, but also that there is this, this ongoing history of this particular place, the Tidewater in Mid-Atlantic and the Great Dismal Swamp as being really tied to that experience. Next slide. And of course, this becomes the Colombian exchange that we're all familiar with, the exportation of many, many uh, plants and species and all kinds of things to Europe and the importation from Europe and Africa of people and livestock and grains, et cetera. A lot of that is passing through this region in ways that are just make it so unique among the entirety of the Atlantic coast. So next slide. So what does that mean for us? Um, is that today we are sitting, living in still that history, that history of interaction, that history of trade, that history 
of change, that history of imposition, that history of recreation, reassertion, resistance. And so we, when we put together the Dismal Swamp Stakeholder Collaborative, really wanted to create a working group, a space for representatives of those histories, people living those histories to really come together and to come together with members of the environmental and conservation community to talk about how we preserve landscapes that have both incredible ecological value and unparalleled cultural and historic value, particularly for Afro-descendant and indigenous communities. And so, our collaborative comprises representatives of conservation NGOs, of municipal uh, government, of uh, some of sort of national government, et cetera, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service agencies, the historic preservation community. But also key is that our collaborative is really centered around folks who are living in those cultural histories. And so representatives from the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, um, the Nansman Indian Nation, the Meharan tribe, the Halawasaponi tribe, descendants of enslaved African-American laborers, descendants of Maroon colonies and those Maroon ancestors, descendants of free people of color in Gates County, something else so unique about the Tidewater, Upper South, Mid-Atlantic region is that even prior to emancipation in 1865, long prior, we had huge amounts of people who were free people of color, who were not enslaved because their African ancestors arrived really early in the in the sort of development of the colonies, and they you know were indentured for a few years and then became free, and all their descendants were free, intermarried often with other free peoples, etc., and created these kind of multi-ethnic. Uh, or multi-ancestral communities of free people of color, one of which is in Gates County, just outside of Desmond Small. Um, and so we came together and we didn't come together with the initial plan to establish a national, her a national heritage area that should read, but we came together with the idea that we wanted to understand what different peoples, different communities, different folks who were still locally very tied to the Desmond Swamp uh, wanted to see in this place. And we have representatives as well of groups like uh, Daughters of the American Revolution and, and folks who are tied in all these kind of different ways. But we wanted to know what is the vision for this place? What do you want to see? And what emerged from that was a simultaneous interest in preserving the natural impact, a unanimous concern about the well-being of the swamp itself, the well-being of the ecology of place. There's a strong sense of place, of our history and our identities being tied to this landscape that matters, that we want to work to preserve. People were excited to learn about the importance of the Dismal Swamp for carbon storage, for biodiversity, for all these things, because it reinforced already a really strong feeling among our group members that this is a place that matters and matters to me, but also matters for the nation and matters for the world. And so where we landed with that ecological concern, as well as with these concerns about culture and public history, um, the second kind of group of conversations we had was around how do we help other people know this, right? Even in the state of Virginia and the state of North Carolina up to Maryland, you know, these people generally don't know much about the Dismal Swamp or about the cultural communities that are tied to it and tied to the whole Mid-Atlantic Tidewater region. So how do we change that? And so we have kind of a subgroup that looks at whether there's opportunities to create curriculum support for K-12 education, other subgroup that looks at kind of public history. We collectively um, are working on a cultural mapping project, but really one of the, the main thing that we landed on was a national heritage area. That would be a protective buffer zone around the existing Great Dismal Swamp Wildlife Refuge and would improve public history, improve access for local uh, communities, as well as attract tourism and attract folks to come and learn about this place. Next slide. And so the way that our operations and structure kind of works is we have now about 78 individual members representing approximately 52 different organizations or groups. We have a three person leadership team, each lead member of the leadership team serving a three year term. Right now, our leadership team is Chief Emeritus Sam Bass from the Nansman Indian Nation, Mr. Benjamin Keeling, who is an elder at Bethel Temple, one of the oldest African-American uh, faith institutions in the region and who grew up in Deep Creek. Uh, myself, <laughs> representing now Ocean Conservancy, previously Wilderness Society. But, and then we have these kind of different tiers of membership. We have advisory members who sort of have the closest alignment to the work that we wanna do. Um, and 
that includes folks like, you know, members of the Meharan tribe, um, you know, members of uh, very, very localized uh, conservation NGOs, et cetera. We have members as well who are kind of a little bit more remote. Alexa, are you still there? Yeah, I can't hear her um, anymore, so. Um, and I don't know, it almost looks like you lost connection. Let's see. Nope, still connected. Um, Alexa, I don't know if you uh, can try to figure out if there's a glitch on your end or um, send us a chat. I can't tell what's going on. This hasn't uh, happened before. The connection had a triangle on it in, you know, insecure yeah. connection or shaky. Shoot. Are there many more slides? I haven't looked at the Hang whole on. thing. A couple more. All right. Well, this is kind of awkward and, and and a new challenge for us. Um, I I don't know how long to wait because I don't know what her um her uh, oh wait I don't know that doesn't help. I haven't seen anything that explains what might be going on. Um, she's not on the participants list anymore, so I'm All wondering right. if we should just see if she comes back later to finish. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, yeah, we'll just we'll just roll with it because I don't know. Um, I guess if anybody has any questions for her, put them in the chat. And, and if she doesn't uh, isn't able to connect again, we can certainly pass those along and um, and continue that conversation. So. In the meantime, I guess we'll go ahead and jump on to the next thing and talk about um, wetlands. Um, and uh, we wanted to to talk a little bit about the um, the guideline or the gosh. So we put together kind of an outline of um, concerns. Is a, a first step in writing a letter, and Ben's going to kind of tell you where we are on that process. Thank you, Whitney. Um, so. In the interest of time, I'm going to go through these roughly uh, or relatively quickly. But um, so the general gist of this is that you know we understand that MRC put out these uh, draft revised wetlands guidelines at the beginning of March. Um, the the original deadline for public comments was uh, supposed to be yesterday, uh, but after some pushback from a variety of stakeholders, the uh, administration they extend or the MRC extended the comment deadline to April sixteenth. Um, and what that means for for us today is that uh, be, instead of going through the the formal and official process as we are doing for the CBPA comments, that we in the, basically because there was no time to go through a, a formal process, um, plan to do staff comments, but we would coordinate those with localities. And so we're proceeding with that. So there's not going to be a vote on these. These will be submitted as a letter from PC staff, um, but we are coordinating with several localities. And I will go ahead and just. Uh, share this uh, our kind of an outline for what we are proposing uh, to submit it as part of our comments, and I'll just highlight a few of those issues um, that are going that are 
the, the key ones that we've identified so far. And so uh, one of these, um, the bigger ones is that, you know, the, so the, the original guidelines that, that were uh, revised in order to address uh, protection of wetlands um, in, a, uh, in response to climate change and sea level rise impacts, in addition to just overall well and protection uh, requirements. Um, so in the existing or the revised guidelines, uh, there are references to the uh, proposed um, and under development Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act regulatory amendments. The concern with this um, is that right now those are not final, uh, whereas the guidelines are the enabling legislation and the requirement for local boards to consider these things is already in effect, and the guidelines are so are already um, what was it? It's April first, so about uh, you know three nine months. <laughs> We've been operating without these guidelines for nine months. Um, in terms of local wetlands boards. And so uh, aligning these with the CBPA seems to be impossible, both from a practical sense and also from a, I think, from a policy perspective, the requirements and the needs for the different, these two different regulatory programs to incorporate climate impacts and address sea level rise and other things um, are a little bit different. And we think that uh, in terms of, you know, our response, it would be better to actually have specific requirements individually tailored for both programs and did not have them directly reference one another. Um, obviously, coordination between these programs is ideal, um, but in terms of the uh, kind of how we move forward, there's literally no way for a locality, once these guidelines are approved, to comply with this component because those regulations are not yet final. Um, so, that's, so that's one issue right there. Um, in terms of uh, wetland types, um, for those of you that have uh, are familiar with the existing uh, wetlands guidelines, there are 17 different types of wetlands that are described in there. The new guidelines combine them into two different categories, uh, vegetated and non-vegetated. There's a requirement in the state code for tidewater communities to concentrate any development that happens in wetlands into wetlands of lesser ecological significance. And so in this regard, um, you know, how do how are localities what so how are the guidelines supposed to help localities accomplish that goal um, if they are not uh, if there's no guidelines to actually say which ones are of lesser ecological significance and which ones are not you know we heard some concerns from localities about uh, for instance Phragmites um, that some localities treat the removal of Phragmites if there's a replanting of other uh, native vegetation or other well in vegetation. Um, they treat that differently in terms of the impacts to vegetation, vegetated wetlands than they do um, other types of vegetated wetlands. So um, certainly something that, that we're planning to highlight. There was a lot of concern over the best available science, and that's something that we've we're prioritizing in our comments as well. Um, you know, we've heard, you know, there are a lot of tools out there. The um, the guidelines basically say everything and anything that's out there. We have different state agencies that are involved in this, and then has this very kind of troubling term, uh, quote, all newly emerging wetland science, unquote. So, um, you know, for us, I think the, the perspective that we've heard is that um, the on-site visits and advice from MRC, from DCRCs, from, from uh, uh, VIMS, um, that those are extremely helpful in helping applicants develop um, proposals that account for site-specific um, conditions and that that identify solutions that will work in the context of those particular properties. Some of the online tools are, are not as helpful. Um, and so in that regard, you know, our point is that we should be prioritizing the on site and that that should take precedence. Um, it would we, we've heard some anecdotes about um, localities receiving conflicting advice from two different agencies, whether it's DCR and BIMS or MRC and BIMS. And so in that regard, I think it might be helpful for us to consider um, or for MRC to consider uh, having a hierarchy um, or providing some guidelines for localities in terms of how to address the, the conflicting advice. Um, that seems to be putting local boards into a difficult spot when you have two state agencies, which are in, um, in supposed to be providing that best available science um, with their on different sides of the issue. Um, one other issue that we've, what we're gonna be talking about is having a separate set of um, standards or a separate process for uh, repairing or replacing existing structures. I had a lot, heard a lot of pushback against this idea that the default should be removal of uh, failing bulkheads or other sorts of um, 
uh, non living shoreline approaches, uh, particularly in those areas where you have like a whole neighborhood or a stretch where there are a lot of hardened shorelines um, that removing one um, would be both costly and would also just be extremely complicated from a, from a practical perspective. So, you know, if we've already disturbed the shoreline requiring a, um, a homeowner to rip out the existing that structure and then replace it with something uh, vegetated um, seemed to be a hard sell. Um, in terms of the climate change considerations, um, we'd really do this ties back into the first issue about CBPA. Part of the this guidance was this was intended to work to tell wetlands boards is like how are you going to how to address sea level rise impacts and other climate impacts on wetlands protection and preservation, and the reference to the CBPA um, doesn't do that. Um, so that you know is something it's a gap that we think needs to be addressed. Um, there from a practical perspective, you know there are a lot of the the scenarios that localities are supposed to look into or the the performance requirements. Are somewhat troubling, um, you know, the 10 year storm event, for example, uh, it's unclear exactly where um, that information is supposed to come from. Um, you know, there are references to NOAA and to FEMA. Um, so, but in terms of widely available data sets for localities to utilize for that to meet that requirement, um, those are not uh, spelled out in the guidelines. And so having that clarity there would be, would be helpful. So working through that, something that we're gonna be recommending um, and then, you know, there's, you know, this is somewhat less of an issue, um, but, or at least um, wasn't as much of a concern as much as so much as a question was, you know, the existing guidelines have criteria for specific types of activities. Um, and the new guidelines or the revised guidelines get rid of every single section, except for the one on shoreline uh, management. So what does that mean for those types of projects? We understand that we're not permitting the same types of projects as we used to. Um, but in it, but these issues still exist, and so having guidelines for those types of projects, it would be helpful to have clarity from MRC as to whether or not those the existing guidelines uh, remain in force for these types of activities, or whether or not they will be um, they are replacing the existing guidelines entirely with the new revised guidelines. That's that's just not clear. Um, so in terms of that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, Jill and I are working on this. Um, the, Drafting the letter, we're having some some discussions with local staff involved in, in these wetlands programs. So um, that's the plan. We will be sending out a draft of the letter to the committee um, once it's finished. Um, but we will really try to take advantage of this extra time that we've been granted to um, to push forward with that coordination and get some more of that kind of back and forth with local staff. Um, and then we will. So we'll send out a draft. We'll solicit comments. But again, we will be submitting this draft as staff, uh, not putting it through a vote from the committee or from the commission. So that's uh, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, would, if anybody has any questions or comments, I think we can. I think our guest speaker from earlier is is, is back in the in the room now, so we'll be able to finish that presentation up momentarily. All right. Thanks, Ben. If if anybody wants, um, you know, has a lot of. Uh, strong feelings about how what we should comment on please reach out to us um like they said we're going to try to talk to the people that we've already heard from that are um you know really um focusing on this uh, but welcome more voices on that one all right last call on questions on wetlands before we circle back uh, to alexa buddy all right well we'll go ahead and let casey pull the slides back up um and we will Go ahead and give Alexa a chance to, to finish her presentation. Sorry about that. Uh oh, I still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for the patience with the technical difficulties, y'all. Um, that's okay. Practice makes perfect, right? So. I think where the last thing you probably heard from me was me starting to describe the operations and structure of the Dismal Swamp Stakeholder Collaborative. And so, like I said, three person leadership team, each member serves a three year term. Right now, it's Chief Emeritus Sam Bass, Elder Benjamin Keeling from Bethel Temple, which is an old, one of the oldest African American faith institutions and who grew up in Deep Creek, um, myself. And then we have these different tiers of membership, advisory members being most core those who have really profound 
long-term cultural and ecological ties to the swamp, um, ties to the swamp or the cultural communities, members being those sort of broadly interested in well-being of the swamp, and then supporters being often national scale organizations support the project, but don't necessarily have the close ties to really work very, um, very intensively on it. Our next meeting is June 18th. It is the day before Juneteenth. So I hope you should all feel welcome to join us for what should be a pretty celebratory gathering. And next slide. And maybe a little bit about kind of the oh, previous slide, yeah, about the timeline of the history to date, you know, and so the Dismal Swamp Stakeholder Collaborative is actually still fairly young in the sense that we started in June 2000, 2019 had that first meeting at Suffolk Public Library. We meet biennially, so we meet in June and December of each year, and in between, there will be kind of informal gatherings of some stakeholder members who are working on particular projects. I mentioned, I think we have a subgroup who's interested in K-12 education, for example, a subgroup who's interested in public signage and improving that, a subgroup who's working on the cultural mapping. And so uh, in between those meetings, we also have our leadership meetings quarterly. But we were fortunate, you know, after that, the first couple of meetings really landing on a national heritage area as being a goal that the community felt would satisfy a lot of the shared, um, the shared vision. We were able to have a feasibility study introduced by Representative Del McEachin in February 2020. Of course, that was quickly subsumed by COVID related legislation that emerged uh, a few months later, but we had that reintroduced in February 2021 part of African American History Month, and it was ultimately attached to the Protecting America's Wilderness and Public Lands larger omnibus. And so that moved very quickly through the House. Um, it's currently moving through the Senate, and we're working on that. And, uh, and so we continue to do that as we continue to do these other projects. But part of the reason why I feel we had so much rapid and early success is in, because genuinely there was already so much energy around the swamp and around this particular tie between ecology and cultural identity and history and people really being able to bring their full selves to our meetings and to the collaborative to say, here are the many different reasons why I care about this place. Next slide. And so this is, you know, some of the coverage that we've had a couple of articles in the Virginian pilot, some articles elsewhere. We are actually waiting on um, an article that's supposed to come out in the Washington Post about the Dismal Swamp and our work as the collaborative in the next, uh, I think, month or so. So keep an eye out for that. But, you know, we are really excited and really proud of the way in which we've been able to call attention to this area, to the Dismal Swamp, but also writ large to the Mid-Atlantic and Tidewater. Next slide. And so we see a huge amount of opportunities here. There's a lot of opportunities for our group, but there's also a lot of opportunities for local municipalities. You know, our group is primarily, is really keenly interested in in conservation of the swamp, but not necessarily as a strictly protectionist group. You know, the idea of working with the National Heritage Area, which is a non-restrictive designation, um, is that a lot of our members want to see local economic growth and expansion. But what they want to ensure is that that economic growth is both inclusive and thoughtful and protects the swamp so that the swamp itself remains a resource for future generations. But there's lots of wins to get here. There's water quality wins, carbon storage wins, and we talked a little bit about that earlier, local economic development, public history and K-12 education wins. Part of our stakeholder collaborative is really keenly interested in creating, for example, drop-in curricular materials for Virginia public schools so that in, in the watershed, uh, kids can learn about the history of the swamp, the history of the watershed, and all of the cultural communities associated with it. Outdoor rec and tourism, obviously this is already pretty well developed around parts of the swamp, but lots more opportunities to tie that to that public history. Being able to, for example, uh, think about how this connects to the East Coast Greenway and how that then connects to having a corridor, a learning corridor, where you could bike along and stop at key sites of critical importance to African-American and indigenous history and learn about that as you're going down the Greenway. These are the kinds of things that the Stakeholder Collaborative is envisioning. And then there's just straight up cultural resource preservation, particularly around those archeological artifacts we talked about earlier, but also folklore, music, arts, all these things that have been inspired by this region and are really tied to it. And then there's also opportunities for higher ed and particularly for working with historically black colleges and universities, um, which we have in 
in abundance here in this region, as well as some of the oldest universities in the country and building stronger ties and stronger bridges there around research and around uh, public history, et cetera. And so, you know, really why we landed on the National Heritage Area is in part because there's a 2018 National Park Service study that really show that really parses out the potential economic benefits. And so we looked at two other sites in particular. We looked at a National Heritage Area that had been established in Louisiana and one in New Jersey and felt like those were really parallel to what we were hoping to see, are hoping to see for the Dismal Swamp and for this region. And there's a lot of opportunity in that for tourism, federal investment, private philanthropy, and kind of calling that together to elevate the history of the region writ large and expand inclusivity in that economic development. So that's where we think there's lots of opportunity for us to work with y'all. We'd love to have you, you know, come to our collaborative meetings, join, join the group, et cetera. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I think that's my last slide. It is indeed. And I want to also make um, very clear that a lot of the work that has a lot of the data and work that you see in this PowerPoint is a result of Catherine Benjamin Golden, who is at University of Delaware, as well as Travis Belot at the Wildlife at the Wilderness Society and Dan Sayers at American University. Um, so their contributions are here and they should have the box too. But thank you or below. And so any questions I am happy to take for a few minutes. I have a question. Sure. Um, I work for the city of Chesapeake. My name is Barbara yeah. Brumbaugh. And I was just wondering, I, I wasn't familiar with this effort. And have you engaged the localities that border the Dismal Swamp? Yeah, so one of our members, um, and in fact, it may be two of our members now, but Heather Barlow has been attending our meetings. Um, I know that she's with city of Chesapeake and she's been our point of engagement on that side. Okay. Um, Mark Furlow has been our point of engagement for the city of Suffolk with their parks and rec department. We have, we're developing points of engagement for city of Norfolk. And then John has been kind enough, of course, to, to link us to you all. All right. Thanks. That was a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I, I just had a quick one. Um, when you said the buffer around it, did you mean um, to expand, I guess, or I was trying to understand what you meant about, you know, what sure. you were going to do to. Yeah, I just don't, I just would like a little more clarification. Sure. Let me make that a little bit clearer. Yeah. So at the core, there is the Great Dismal Swamp National Wildlife Refuge, right? So you can imagine it almost like Russian nesting dolls where that. Um, doesn't change under the project that we're working on. The refuge itself is working to expand the refuge, and we absolutely support that. We love working with Chris Lowey to help his vision come to life as well for what the wildlife refuge can do. But what this would do, this National Heritage Area, would be kind of a broader designation that would go around and include the wildlife refuge, but wouldn't take land away from the wildlife refuge, nor would it add to the wildlife refuge. It would be a larger sort of delineated area that, again, a non restrictive designation, but 1 that delineates a region in which additional investment can be made. That helps. Thanks. Yeah. Alexa, um, do any of these efforts with the collaborative or the natural heritage area, um, have they been tying in or uh, looking at any of the, um, the efforts by um, groups to restore historically diminished tree species like longleaf pine and. Atlantic white cedar. Yeah, so 1 of our members um, is from the nature conservancy. Um, and, uh, the Bobby Klontz and Bobby actually works explicitly on that longleaf pine project that TNC has been engaged with in the region. And so, while we haven't yet identified a specific way in which the collaborative works on that or helps with that, other than that broadly, we support it. And if we're asked to do something in support, we are happy to. Um, that is absolutely a part of the conversation, you know, restoration writ large is a part of the conversation, you know, watershed restoration, tree species restoration. We had some folks join us from the rare, the Virginia rare plant society as well. Um, and yeah, and so that's, that's definitely been in the mix, but, uh, hasn't yet identified a specific pathway forward, but maybe in meeting number 4. So, or okay, maybe. great. 
And is there any um, thought on possibly looking at like increasing management either in the areas in or around the swamp to um, hopefully lessen the chances of these large fires that um, will uh, affect the peat soils, maybe like increase prescribed burning to you know lessen future fire impacts? Yeah, so there has been conversation about that that's taken place between folks from environmental conservation NGOs and Chris, um, so Fish and Wildlife Service. I don't know that that has come to a particular decision point yet, but that absolutely has been part of the conversation. What's very clear to everyone in the collaborative is that swamp is too dry and it burns too often and it burns too much. So, yeah. And prescribed fire being a part of a management regime that would both be thoughtful, we believe effective, and also reflect some indigenous ways of managing that landscape is has absolutely been a part of that conversation. Thanks. But we'd love to have you join and talk more about it if you'd like. Okay, I'll send you an email. Sounds good. about investment um, within the delineated buffer area. Um, what exactly are you thinking of as far as area? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, so one, we've looked at federal funding opportunities and federal funding programs, and then also things like National Trust for Historic Preservation. Does it create, by being a, a delineated national heritage area, it sort of gives us a little bit more weight to ask for things like funds to preserve historic buildings, like funds to work on restoration from Fish and Wildlife Service, things like this. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that I think we've primarily been looking at and thinking about when we say additional investment. Okay. Yeah. But if you've got more ideas, bring them in. We'd love to figure out how to get more investment into the swamp and the surrounds. So I have another follow-up question about the buffer areas that you were talking sure. about. Do you already have something mapped out that you're that you all have in mind? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and yes, at a core scale is the answer. Okay. So what we um, did is actually for the National Heritage Area, the feasibility study, we proposed just a list of counties. Um, surrounding that would be impacted. So I am happy to send folks uh, via John, I guess, a copy of the bill so that you can see the listing of counties that were identified as being sort of in the region. But keep in mind that that's a preliminary list because this bill is for a feasibility study. This doesn't establish the heritage area yet, but it proposes okay. this is where we think the heritage area should be. So if there's something that's missed out, if there's something that's you know inappropriately added, that can still be adjusted at this time. All right, well, thank you for joining us, Alexa, and I, I hopefully this is a, has been a good opportunity to expand your your network and, and make more people aware of what's going on and uh, continue the dialogue. So thank you very much. Absolutely. And, thank you so much. And I'm going to drop my email in the chat. Um, just if anyone is interested in learning more or in potentially joining us on June 18th, please shoot me an email. Great. All right, Thanks. well, I will move on uh, to the next agenda item. Um, we're going to talk about um, the CBPA um, comment letter. Um, I don't have any slides today. I felt like um, we've talked about this a lot. Um, and uh, I just want to thank everybody who sent us feedback. Um, Y'all have been really responsive. Um, we sent out the revised draft letter in this agenda packet and, and in emails. Um, Got to thank um, Jill for wading through all of the comments. We we got a lot of comments and we did our best to um, sort them and re represent um, mm -hmm. everybody's responses. Uh, I just want to point out uh, the one change we made since we sent out the draft letter was a comment from James City County asking us to more explicitly say that um, you know changes in the CRS points tied to open space might impact insurance premiums. So we added that. Um, I think most people probably looked at the revised letter pretty pretty closely if you're interested, but you know, one of the significant, I think, changes in style is we did try to write more recommendations, um, not just say that like, something was unclear or vague, but to try to put something specific out. And the reason we did that is to it just seems our experience with comment letters is the more we can be 
um, like put something forward, the more um, maybe serious we the response is from the state. And you know, the main goal here is to try to to make it clear um, that there's still a lot of questions about this, and that more time would be worthwhile and more debate about how to make this sort of perfect reg. Um, the other thing is we did. You might not have noticed this. I'll just point it out. We suggested copying the Hampton Roads um, Caucus and the State Water Control Board on our letter because we would like um, to get more attention to it. Um, hopefully, like I said, get a, a serious consideration of, of slowing down the process and having a bigger stakeholder process. But anyway, those were the changes um, as well as some other details. Um, just sort of try to remind people. You know, our goal is to try to write a a solid letter that has a lot of consensus issues and um, we know it's not perfect and we didn't uh, capture every comment everyone sent us partly because sometimes they were in conflict but um I, I hope people are are satisfied with it we didn't hear much in the last week and uh you know it just kind of goes back to this is complicated it's hard to do it just right um we had a couple of people say on things like um oh like the coastal resiliency impact assessment it would be great to have the details worked out regionally and be consistent. Um, we would be happy as a PDC to work on that if that's part of the final reg. Um, but it is hard to work out all the details on this timeline. So um, you you weren't ignored. It's just not feasible um, as part of the letter. Um, let's see. The other thing I just want to encourage all the localities if you um, to write your own letter that certainly more letters probably good and then if there's some points you want to highlight that we didn't um, you can add them in there um, so that's sort of where we are um, re remember today our thought was um, we'd like to send uh, a recommendation to our commissioners uh, for their april 15th meeting to um, to send this letter forward to the state water control board and um, deq and uh, and do that as an official advisory committee to the commission. So um, I um, I want to open it up for discussion. If anybody feels like we really need to make more changes, that'll be, I'm not encouraging it, but I, at the same time, I want to make sure you're happy with this letter before we vote on it. So um, please speak up if you have any suggestions or comments before we um, ask for a motion. Come on, I'm sure somebody has something to say. Go ahead, Nate. Uh, I've looked through this and uh, I've seen some of my stuff that I put in it added. I did not see anything regarding the grandfathering issue. Uh, and I know how well uh, that flies with certain regulators. Um, what I may be doing is just taking the rough draft that I sent you and uh, telling him that our comments uh, uh, appear in red. If you have no problem with that. I just want to reserve the right to raise this at a later point. Sure. sure. Uh, so you just mean, um, are, are you thinking you're going to send a separate letter from the city? What I'm thinking of doing is sending the one that I sent to you from the city, indicating that uh, the vast majority of this is HRPDC uh, comments that uh, we agree with locally, and there are a couple of other additions. I see. Sure, I understand. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I like I said, um, all the localities. If you have points, like I said, that you want to. Um, to emphasize, by all means, yeah, send another letter because um, we did our best, uh, given this process and timeline, to to incorporate things, but also like, um, yeah, there might be a few things that that got dropped. Um, not uh, not just you, but everybody. So, anybody else have a comment? Well, I would like to uh, praise the effort. You told me that it was primarily Jill and Ben that. <laughs> That and I thought they did a pretty masterful job of that, and I thank them for it. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yeah, these are uh, this was a this was a tough one to wade through and to try to come up with uh, meaningful comments. So uh, I second yeah. that. The letter was really, really well written, um, very concise, um, great comments. Um, I hope they 
accept your first comment, which is to not implement the rig in this manner. <laughs> yeah, I just think it's too important to um, rely on guidance that hasn't even been developed yet to implement it because we know how long that could take. I mean, I think we're looking at years possibly before a guidance document is developed. So yeah. that that seems really Brilliant. disturbing to think that this reg could get implemented with no guidance in place. Well, um, let's see, was it yesterday? Two days ago, I think. Um, we met with um, our the PDC subcommittee, which is elected officials, and talked a little bit about this. And I did encourage them to um, to reach out to the state water control board or anybody if they if they have um, sort of connections to to get some more attention to this and just say, hey, if we if we moved a little slower, put a little more effort into this, we might have a better product. Hard hard to say what kind of changes will be made based on all the public comments, but uh, yeah. yeah, there's room for improvement. Anybody else before you move on to a vote? All right, if not, can I have a motion to, um, let's see, what did we say? Um, recommend that the HRPDC board approve uh, the final comment letter on the CBPA regulatory amendments. Motion to have the board approve the letter. <laughs> I second. All right. I think Pete is going to hate. He's gonna vote. Vote. I guess one more option one opportunity more to option. comment before we go. Comment before we go. Okay, so we'll okay. go through the, so we'll go the through role the again, role um, again. Like, we like we did earlier. Okay, so Chesapeake, Barbara okay. Romo. Chesapeake, Barbara Romo. Approve. Approve. Franklin, Carly Smith. Franklin, Carly Smith. Gloucester, Mike Hudgens and Kevin Landry. Hudgens and Kevin Landry. Kevin, you're muted if you're, Kevin, still, you're here. Muted if you're still here. Uh, Hampton, Let's circle back to Coster. Hampton, Greta Hawkins. We approve, and we're also sending a letter separately, too. So. Isla White, David Kuzma. James City County, Tony Small and Mike Wilson. We approve. Okay. Uh, Newport News, Kim Mosher. We approve. Norfolk, Justin Schaefer, June Whitehurst. We approve. The Coast and Dan and O'Connell. Portsmouth, Meg Pittinger and Thomas Palmbaum. We approve. Smithfield, Tammy Clary, Jack Reed. Southampton County, Beth Lewis. Yes. Suffolk, Aaron Roundtree. Approve. Virginia Beach, Melanie Coffey, and Diana St. John. Approved. Williamsburg, Heather Markle, and Aaron Small. Approved. York County, Kent Henkel. Approved. And Gloucester County, Kevin, are you back? All right, well, we have, at, uh, let's see. 11 affirmative, so that's the yeah, that clears the threshold. We're motion carries. 
All right, thank you all. And uh, um, by all means, uh, you know, make sure uh, your your city manager, county minister, or know this is going on. I think we've 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 uh, vetted this more than ever before. So hopefully, people are expecting to see this letter, and they'll be comfortable with it. And we can keep this moving because um, you know this is all driven by the May third deadline to send make comments. But anyway, so thanks um, everybody for this. Uh, engaging in this long process and giving us good feedback. Um, hopefully this is a good way to, to get some change. Um, any more comments before we go um, back to, I think we have time to do environment Virginia. It's pretty short. Um, all right. Well, um, I'll let Casey bring up some slides. I think on that and jump in if you have any questions before we get to get started. All right. Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'll keep it brief um, because, it, yeah, it, it's been a long meeting, but um, a good one, though. Um, we, uh, myself and Ben, were the only two staff that attended the 2021 Environment Virginia Symposium. I don't know if anyone else was able to join. It was a really hard format. Hard to see who was there. I, I just really, really, really missed the in person um, this year. So um, I didn't, I, I just, some of the things up front about the format, it was pretty much like maybe one or two talks at a time um, or like panels and then kind of crammed in those panels and then no time really for questions and answers. They would have this separate discussion piece uh, some other time of day or in my case on a whole other day. So very frustrating in terms of feedback and conversation, hard to have that. Um, they really just kept you on time and kept you moving, present and move on. So didn't didn't care for that. But um, lots of big themes this year, unsurprising because they had to do a kind of big overarching themes. Um, I'll touch upon the regulatory update and the Chesapeake Bay uh, themes that were discussed. And Ben's going to touch on the climate resilience themes. Um, I can hardly speak about clean energy that was talked about or the environmental justice pieces that were talked about because most of those sessions were concurrent with either ones I was in or when I was speaking in or my discussion session. So it, it was really hard to get a taste of everything. They say they're going to have um, everything up and available for us to view, but only for 90 days. I haven't seen those yet, so can't. I, I wanted to give you some feedback on these other ones, but that's really hard to do when I didn't see them. So. The regulatory update, uh, it was a lot, there were more folks that spoke than just Jeff Steers, Yuta Schneider, and Melanie Davenport, but I wanted to hit the highlights. Um, the air permitting guy spoke, the enforcement spoke. So um, Jeff kind of just talked about some big picture items, the, the waste division and recycling task force. I thought this was interesting. They have a stakeholder group of 18 folks that are gonna study diverting waste from landfills in the Commonwealth. And that, that report's not due for another year and a half. Um, mentioned brownfields and that funding, of course, is always available on a rolling basis at about $50,000. That's for the Virginia um, brownfields program. Um, PFAS was another topic that was had several sessions, but I didn't get to attend any, but they are developing a PFAS strategy uh, within the Commonwealth with an interagency response team, risk communication plan and source identification. I think they're taking their cues from the EPA on this one, but something to keep track of. Um, and probably will affect mostly the, the groundwater piece. Um, and then EPA did conduct a virtual audit of the DEQ 50s water program. Um, I'll be really interested to, to see the findings of that report, but that won't be out until April. So I think they got a pretty decent cursory preliminary review, but um, be interesting to see what they actually had to say. Um, Yuta, so she talked, these are some of her highlights. Um, the Turbidity Water Quality NORA is coming out um, in a couple of weeks, actually, um, and that will the wrap will be formed after that. And they hope to have an approval at the September State Water Control Board meeting. So, in the interest of doing things really fast these days, um, I was kind of shocked about that one. Um, can, but I haven't seen the NORA yet, so I really can't can't say what that's gonna if that will impact our localities or not. Um, the Chesapeake Bay program again is is talking about PFAS and they have formed a PFAS work group. So I thought it was interesting that you to mention that. Um, they are going to begin incorporating, um, as environmental justice was a very large theme of this meeting, um, they're gonna start to use the EJ screen tool that was created by EPA uh, in a pilot project for the, the, uh, the annual monitoring program that they have. I'm not really sure how that's gonna work. Um, and she didn't elaborate, but I just thought that was really interesting that they're gonna have a different, they're gonna add to their monitoring planning um, program. 
We've already gone through the CBPA regulatory updates, so she did touch on that, though. The SAG would start in May, and we will have, um, they, they aim for approval at the State Water Control Board meeting in June, so I just thought that, you know, she's still on schedule. And then, I don't know if any of you guys have been involved in the Chesapeake Bay stakeholder group about no discharge zone. Uh, the Commonwealth is applying to have all of, I guess, all the Virginia tidal waters to be no discharge zones. Um, Elizabeth Andrews from BCPC has been co conducting interviews and um, Jill, Whitney and I attended one of those interviews and just discussed how that would work. Um, but she'll do, I guess it was 80 stakeholder interviews and then they make a recommendation to the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth makes a recommendation or a request to EPA. Um, so that was an, a WIP initiative that they really wanted to achieve. So that, that, have, that was mentioned by UDA. Melanie uh, actually didn't even get to finish her piece. <laughs> Um, and so she had a, there was a discussion session later on in the day where she kind of went on longer. Um, but she did bring up the non point source nutrient credit training guidance and the um, local impairment hierarchy that that uh, group technical advisory group, I guess, hasn't finished. And that discussion uh, will resume in April and I've, I've already seen the town hall notifications on that one. Um, the water quality management reg. So. There's a lot of confusion going on with this. There's actually a public hearing today. Um, and that regulation is to be updated per the wrap where they were to include the floating waste load allocations. However, legislation kind of countered that. And so it's really muddying the waters as to how you publicly participate and what's really going to evolve out of the rest of this. But I believe it means the floating waste load allocations um, are going to be addressed from that um, regulation. Um, due to the result of the legislation. So she was even very confused by it and said, if you don't understand this, just call me because I, I can't explain it to you. <laughs> um, and then she talked about changes to WOTUS. There's a lot of things that changed from the last administration and with the EPA and now a lot of litigation. And so everything's in a lot of flux. And so they're trying to figure out a path forward um, for the new navigable waters protection rule, but they can't when there's li things in litigation and things are changing all the time. So. She sounded very um, confused by a lot of things, but I guess that's kind of that's that's Melanie. But um, so then there was a discussion session later on that was hard because it was a lot of it was um, there were some questions about CDPA, but it was Melanie really talking about a lot of the um, stuff she couldn't finish talking about earlier in the day. Um, that's all I had for the regulatory update. Um, if you have any questions about that, just let me know. Um, I just want to move on though to the base stuff. So there were three sort of panels on the bay. I participated in a broadening partnerships and building capacity for bay restoration with James Martin at DEQ, um, another PDC, as well as the Soil Water Conservation District, just talking about our role as a, a collaborative role in terms of the contract we received from DEQ to help with the WIP efforts. Again, this was all proposed last year, so some of it's a little bit dated, and we had to kind of revamp a lot of it, but. Um, that was a good talk, but no conversation, no discussion. It was so then we there was another one the next day about Chesapeake Bay restoration. Where do we stand and where are we headed with um, Ann Jennings, Ann Swanson, EPA and DCR. Um, and then another one on the Bay BMP challenges and innovations, which was more like. Um, big picture, what, what are kind of some innovative ideas um, from the ag side, the stormwater side um, and Joe Wood talked about mussels. But we had that discussion session, but it was just the two sessions at the top there that we had a discussion session about. So it kind of got um, really uh, more big picture topics were discussed. And so the major themes were uh, about environmental justice, equitable community engagement, uh, effective communication strategies, particularly with, with community groups. Um, how do we expand capacity, whether it's PDCs or involvement in big program um, um, implementation? Uh, implementation needs. Uh, James was very clear to say that we aren't going to get anywhere without more implementation and uh, innovative solutions. That was a lot about that that other that last panel there. That um, again, really hard to have discussions, but it was it was good information. Um, so Ben, I think you can talk a little bit more about some of the community uh, the um, climate resilience talks since you participated in one of those. Yeah, so we had um, we you know, a few technical discussions about resilience issues. Uh, Karen from the Green Infrastructure Center talked about some of the work that they've done with Norfolk. Um, long technical uh, discussion there. Um, 
I wasn't able to appear this one, but um, you know, Casey had high praise for this community driven climate resilience strategy. A lot of talk throughout the conference about engaging communities. I think this this push for um, you know talk about environmental justice is something that the administration is taking seriously. There's a lot of interest in that now, and how do we effectively engage communities? Um, and so I think that's something that's going to stick around for quite some time um, and probably expand even more. Um, uh, Admiral Phillips gave one of the plenary talks about the status of the coastal resilience master plan. Um, so that I think along with the CBPA and the wetlands, you know, updates that these are three resilience related issues that the administration is really hanging its hat on right now. So there's that kind of, I think, you know, we're running into these headwinds about, you know, we want these regs to be better. We want these processes to be better. Um, but the calendar says that they're, you know, their their administration is over in less than, you know, less than a year. Um, and so they really want to get these things done. And they're really, they're really proud of this work. They think that this is, you know, these things are going to have a good significant positive impact. Um, that they're going to make some real headway with it. And um, so that's the kind of, I think, one of the things that we just have to keep in mind when we're talking about, okay, well, we're not really happy with exactly what's coming out of it. They really are happy with it. And so just recognizing that. And then I was able to give a talk about some of the work that we're doing with our resilience committee and our program on some of the, the policy and analysis work that we're doing and, and talk a little bit about um, outreach through Get Flood Fluent and some of the other work there. So, yeah, I, I, again, with them, you know, as what Casey said about the format, it was a little strange. Um, I ended up talking for almost an hour, about 40 minutes, and then having QA. So I had a session all to myself. And, you know, I love the sound of my own voice, but I don't love it that much. So that was a you know interesting uh, way to to implement the the conference. I think we're all looking forward to to being back in Lexington next year, um, you know, both for the the extracurricular activities and then also for the opportunities that those in person discussions um, that they have. A, there's a lot of benefits of being there and being able to ask questions and follow up and and doing things within the sessions, but then to have those ongoing conversations outside of the sessions and you know it's it's a challenge with just the, the format but i think we're all looking forward to being back up there next year um i like i said i cannot talk about the rest of these because i wasn't able to attend any of them but solar was very dominant there's a big energy theme um i had already attended the solar summit that was a partially put on by the commonwealth the week before so it seemed like a lot of overlap um, but these are just the titles of some of those panels. And when I can investigate those more, I can provide more information. Um, similarly, with the environmental justice, I was not able to attend any of these, but they were some, um, I believe, well attended talks. Um, but I, I just wasn't able to. I think I did go to the one working to embed environmental justice in the Commonwealth. Yeah, that had David Paler in it. Um, and he, you know, just trying to talk about the path ahead for how they're going to integrate it into the, um, the, the different agencies, but I didn't, I didn't hear a clear path to be quite honest. Um, and then, oh, so the, the fun part was that Skip Stiles won the Urkel Environmental Leadership Award, Wetland Watch's uh, very own. So I thought that was great. And he gave a great presentation and a great speech. Um, and then of course they have that typical uh, fireside chat, I like to call it with the secretaries of natural resources with um, Bettina Ring and Matt Strickler. Um, as Matt, as Ben said, it was pretty much we, we are achieving our goals. We are working towards achieving these goals um, and especially related to the WIP3 and climate change and resiliency and the CBPA regs. Um, and then the other thing I thought was interesting was what um, Secretary Strickler said about, you know, we have all been looking about uh, looking to some of these reports and work groups that have been created from the General Assembly over 2020 and 2021, a lot of those got delayed. And he basically said, yeah, COVID really just hit us hard and we were allowed to prioritize. So things like the tree study, uh, trees and bees and trees as BMP study was one that was specifically brought up. Um, and essentially they were allowed to prioritize, put them on the shelf for a little while. And he says, they're all gonna start back in the next month. Um, a lot of those reports and work groups. So I guess to show up for the next round of the general assembly. Um, and then other topics, like I mentioned, that I couldn't attend all of these, but they had PFAS discussions. I think there were two sessions on that, um, one or two on forest conservation, and then the governor's environmental excellence awards. So a lot crammed into a small amount of time. It was absolutely impossible. You couldn't just run from one room to the next. You know, I mean, I guess you could virtually, but I, I, did, I felt like I would be doing myself a disservice by trying to do that. So um, 
a lot of content. Also, they had even what was called asynchronous bonus sections where you could uh, go ahead and click on some presentations. But again, I, I have yet to do that. Um, so that's all I have for Environment Virginia. Yeah, one thing I'll add um, that just kind of came out in the some of the the process stuff that Secretary Strickler talked about in terms of the work groups and the reports, but also during some of the Q and A, um, there was a question about um, whether or not the exemption from the Administrative Procedures Act was that we whether we should expect that to be the norm going forward. That you know that whether that would like they would just try to you know circ you know circumvent the the standard process of having stakeholder advisory groups or regulatory advisory panels and um, the the response to the question was uh, in a nutshell well the legislature puts it in there so uh, we're just doing what they tell us so I, I think this is something that that from a process perspective you know we've talked about it today in the context of wetlands and the CBPA um, but just in general you know. There didn't seem to be any a, a wholehearted endorsement of the value of of these stakeholder engagement processes to develop good policy. Um, I didn't hear any regret <laughs> in anyone's voice when they were talking about how they haven't been able to have these work group meetings. Um, so if if that's something that that we think is important, and I think you know in the context of our letters, um, we certainly do um, for, for that we talked about today. Um, but that's something I think we're going to have to to push back on and emphasize. It's like these, you know, we know that they, these processes can take a while to play out, but they have value, and it sometimes is worth it to take that extra time to make sure we get the policy right, as opposed to just trying to do something in a short amount of time just because we don't want to wait and we're being impatient. So, I mean, I know we had some dis some difficulties over the last year with uh, restrictions on meetings and challenges of doing everything virtually, but, um, yeah. So we'll see how that goes forward. All right, any questions? Anybody else attend and want to have comment on uh, Environment Virginia? Okay. Oh, and congrats, Skip, for the big award. I think he's still on. All right, well, the last thing on our agenda is so the round table. So I'm just gonna go through different groups, see if anybody has any announcements they wanna share. Um, anybody from state agencies? Uh, NGOs, any updates, comments? Consultants? Local government? Whoever's left, I think we might have a few others. We might have a few others. Well, I appreciate every. Oh. I appreciate every oh. Oh, maybe no comments. So, well, thank you all for hanging around uh, for our um, full two hours. Um, PDC staff will probably hang, um, stay on the line for a few minutes if you have any. Um, things you want to share, but otherwise we are adjourned and thank you all for joining us. See you next month. And thank you. Kim, Ben, I just want to say thanks for that update about Environment Virginia. That was helpful for me. Save yeah, it was helpful for me too because I didn't attend. <laughs> Bye guys.